part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, this is Chase Smith, founder and CEO of Press Play Podcast. You may have heard me on the Oranges, Oranger, Cleveland Browns podcast with Jeremy Powell, now wonderfully hosted by Holly Wetzel, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast with Sam Amico, or my own podcast, the Chase Smith Podcast. I wanted to take a few moments to talk to you about a brand new subscription-based podcast we're offering this football season, the Press Play Sports Podcast. This premium podcast feed will send all of the sports podcasts offered on the Press Play Podcast Network to one central feed. Yes, you can still follow and subscribe to all of our individual shows for free on every podcast platform, but if you wanted to consolidate your podcast feed and listen to them all in one location, the Press Play Sports Podcast is for you. I'm talking the Oranges and Orange Browns podcast with Holly Wetzel and Jeremy Powell, Red Guy and Rhoda, Sable Brothers on the Baseline, Cavs on the Break, the Dennis Maniloff Show, the Ball Card Show, the Premium Fantasy Podcast, a Swing and a Tribe MLB Podcast, and the Tim and Shipe Show, a college football podcast, all in one feed. All nine of our sports shows curated into one single podcast feed. Out the door, you're looking at five thirty six a month after tax. That's five dollars and thirty six cents, just about the cost of a drink at Starbucks. And this is only offered on Apple Podcasts. You can't get this anywhere else. It's an Apple Podcast exclusive. Just go to the search bar and search "Press Play Sports." It'll come up, and you and you can subscribe from there. We're excited to offer this consolidated, curated sports feed for you to enjoy. And as always, thank you so much for listening and your support. Welcome to the latest edition of the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm Dennis Maniloff, along with producer extraordinaire Chase Smith. And we come to you after the Cleveland Indians defeated the Texas Rangers six to nothing in Texas to close out their 2021 season. The Indians finished 80 and 82, 13 games back of the front running Chicago White Sox in the AL Central. The AL Central was a mess, quite frankly, because after the 93 and 69 White Sox, there were four sub 500 teams. The Indians, the Tigers at 77 and 85, the Royals at 74 and 88, and the Twins at 73 and 89. The AL Central, no doubt, was a mess, and it's unfortunate the Indians were unable to sustain any contention uh, deep into the season. Plenty of injuries, no question about it, especially on the pitching side of things. They had a small margin for error to begin with. So you couldn't have expected them to dominate uh, with those injuries or even contend and run with a 93-win team like the White Sox. That said, it's still a disappointment anytime uh, a professional team in your town does not make the playoffs or threaten the playoffs. It's disappointing unless they're in the first year of a rebuild, which is not the case here. Um. I know that a lot of people saw this as a transition year, okay, but nonetheless, it was a sub-500 season. First time the Indians finished with a losing season and even a non-winning season, for that matter, since 2012. That was the year before Terry Francona began managing in Cleveland. So Terry Francona had a run from 2013 through – last year of winning seasons that ended this year. We know Terry Francona did not end the season in the dugout, but the hope that the organization has is that he will return after uh, dealing with some, uh, some health issues. The game was significant for, because it ended the season, but it was very significant because it ended an era. It, It ended a, you know, two centuries run by the Cleveland Professional Baseball Club as the Indians. The Indians began, or the team began being called the Indians in 1915, and it ended when the final out was made for the the Indians against the Rangers on Sunday in Texas. Now the, from now on, it'll be the Guardians, we understand the history remains and, and everything else, but it still has a weird feel that the uh, professional baseball team is no longer the Indians. It will be the Guardians. 
And I know a lot of the transition has already started because they announced it during the season, but the clock has officially begun now that the book has been closed on the 2021 regular season. When we return, I want to get into my favorite Indian and the type of season he had and what needs to be done for this particular player. Hi, this is Maria Ginkola with Mindful MMJ Ohio. Did you know that medical marijuana has been legal in Ohio since 2016? If you have one of 25 qualifying medical conditions, you can obtain your medical marijuana card today. The most common conditions are chronic pain, including migraines and back or joint pain, PTSD, fibromyalgia, spinal cord disease or injury, and cancer. If you or someone you know is interested in learning more or to find out if you qualify, visit mindfulmmjohio.com and fill out the short pre-qualification form. The process of finding a physician, filling out paperwork, obtaining medical records, and scheduling an appointment seems like it would be a daunting process for most. But lucky for you, Mindful MMJ Ohio will help you every step of the way to make the process quick and easy. In most cases, we can approve a qualified patient within 24 hours. And the visit is virtual, so you don't even have to leave home. So what are you waiting for? Visit MindfulMMJOhio.com today. That's MindfulMMJOhio.com. Let us help you be more mindful of your health and find a natural way to find relief from your symptoms. The r r Podcast going to be rocking and rolling with you because football season is underway. College, Ohio State, the Power Fives, the Mac, the Browns. Michael Regai, are you ready to rock and roll with some football? Yeah, yeah, I've been ready. This is our time of year. This is what r r is all about. We're going to be with you every week. And he just said it, Browns, NFL, Ohio State-centric. So you got to stay with us all fall and winter long here on r r that's right, the Red Eye and Rhoda podcast coming to you here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe now and don't miss a show. Hey everyone, I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Jeremy Powell. And we are your hosts of The Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need each week to get you ready for kickoff and beyond. Don't miss our breakdowns of each week's matchups, game recaps, and any and all news out of Bria to feed your Browns appetite. As we all know, Holly, dogs got to eat. That's right, Jeremy. Hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen. Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. We're talking about the Indians who finished 80 and 82 and out of the money in the 2021 uh, playoffs. They're, they're, not, they're sitting at home for the second time in three years. And unfortunately for the franchise, they have not won a playoff game in their last eight attempts. They're 0 for their last eight in games. Haven't won a playoff game since the 2017 Division Series Game 2 when they took a 2-0 lead on the Yankees. So it's a problem, and this was a tough year to deal with from all angles. A lot of controversy swirling around with the name change. You had injuries. You had underperformance. You had illness to the manager. Uh, or, you know, health concerns to the manager on top of that. But it's over, and there aren't that many highlights you can pull from an 80 and 82. But the guy who was clearly the MVP of this team, without question, no doubt about it, was Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez, 152 games. 111 runs, 32 doubles, five triples, 36 homers, 103 RBI, 297 total bases, 72 walks, 27 steals, 6.6 war. Jose Ramirez is a great player, and he had another great season. And this season happened to be the final year of 
the final guaranteed year of his five-year, $26 million contract. And you've heard me on these, uh, in these, in this podcast shout from the rooftops, how unbelievable that contract has turned out to be. Well, that guaranteed portion has officially closed 2017 through 2021. This is what Jose Ramirez gave the Indians for their quote unquote investment of 26 million. 648 games, 441 runs, 676 hits, 175 doubles, 19 triples, 144 ribbies, 420 RBI, 112 steals, 313 walks, a 140 OPS plus, and a 911, 912 uh, on base plus slugging. Absolutely ridiculous value. I submit. When you're talking about total value for the club, it is the most um, the, the, the most mind blowing contract in the history of the game. In other words, the club got more value. The Indians got more value for this contract than any other contract I can think of in Major League Baseball for multiple years. And I'd love to, somebody to find me another one, even if it's not for $26 million, but even if it's for $100 million, Find me a player who produced more for what he was paid in a multi-year deal than Hosey did for his five for 26. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there because the Indians have club options in 2022 and 2023 on Jose Ramirez. 2022, it's 11 million plus 1 million for performance bonus, which he hit. So it's a 12 minute, a $12 million club option in 2022. And then a 13 million club option in 2023 with a $1 million performance bonus. I hate to say it, but I believe that the Indians are going to pick up that club option, certainly in 2022. And the reason I hate to say it is because it would be a travesty because once again, the Indians would be saying to Jose Ramirez, we're going to, get an unbelievable return on our investment as we pick up option year number six or the sixth year, first year of the options. What I've said all along is that the Indians need to tear up the two club options, void them and offer them a new deal. Something in the neighborhood of four years for a hundred million, make it reasonable. You're not going to offer them 200 or 300 million. I think Ramirez knows that. So you're not going to offer not only that number, but you're not going to offer 10, 12 years. You make it a, a decent number of years, nothing outlandish uh, the, along the Lindor lines of 10 years for 30, 341 million. I, I, I totally understand that. I'm being realistic enough to know that the Dolan ownership is not going to shell out that kind of cash. But to me, for Jose Ramirez, the best player in the game, I mean, the best player in the on the team, one of the best players in the game, the face of the franchise, the personality of the franchise, the engine. The Indians owe him figuratively and literally. They owe him more money and they owe him given what he's meant to this team, to this fan base, and given what he was playing for the previous five years. If you exercise the option, what you're saying to Ramirez is, we got you on the cheap for five years, and we're going to get you on the cheap for another year after that. That's unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. And I'm, I'm afraid that's the way they're going to go. I pray it's not. And to me, all the blame for this, if it does get picked up, lies with ownership doesn't lie with president Chris Antonetti or GM Mike Chernoff it's ownership saying you know what we got to deal with Ramirez and 
we got a steal with Ramirez, and we're just going to keep riding that steal. And I know when people hear me talk about how Ramirez is getting ripped off and all this, I, what do you mean? He's a multimillionaire. He's going to make tens of millions of dollars with the Indians. and He can go make some more elsewhere, and people would love to have that. Yeah, I, I understand all that. For the umpteenth time, it's comparing apples to oranges. Comparing a professional sport contract and let alone a major professional sport like MLB to that of a teacher or a firefighter or an administrator. It's just a fool's errand. It makes no sense. Don't do it. Okay. They're, athletes live in their own little world. And whenever I talk about Ramirez getting ripped off, I'm talking about vis-a-vis his peers. I'm talking about within his game. I'm not talking about him vis-a-vis society. Okay? I can't stress that enough. I would love everybody to get paid what professional athletes get paid. I would love to get paid what professional athletes get paid. But that's not the world in which we live. And so I only deal with what happens and what's reality and reality is players of Ramirez's caliber get paid a ton of money Ramirez by virtue of his war by or based on his war based on his production is a 25 to 30 million dollar player and he was playing for an average of 5.2 million dollars over the past five years and even with the so-called raises or the what look to be raises and and they are but even with those Numbers for 2022 and potentially 2023, he's still vastly underpaid. And I know that the two, that the four for 100 million would still put him at an average annual value below 30. I mean, it averages at 25. But part of the appeal for that is that on an average annual value basis, you'd be guaranteeing him 50 million over 2022 and 2023, whereas the most he could make on his options plus bonuses is 26. If he stuck with that, you know, if he stayed with that, I think the Indians at least need to make Ramirez think about accepting an offer, offer him something legitimate, offering something substantial with a significant raise. He may turn it down, but at least you didn't insult him. That's what I believe in the case of Jose Ramirez should be done, but I'm not Hold my breath. By the way, Jose Ramirez in that five-year contract led the majors in extra base hits. He led the majors in extra base hits for $26 million. It's just mind-blowing. All right, when we return, I will give you my Guardians to-do list for what needs to be not should be, but needs to be a very busy off season. This is Mike Voorhees, co-host of the Swing and a Tribe MLB podcast. If you love Cleveland Indians baseball, then this is the pod for you. We've got you covered each week as we talk about all the games, breaking news, trades, the roster, all things Tribe. You're going to love it. Go Tribe. Hey, I'm Jason. And I'm Gary. And and we we love love ball cards. And if you love ball cards too, good news. You just found your new favorite podcast. From breaks to grading. And from collecting to flipping, join us on the Ball Card Show. The sports podcast for the sports collector. Hey, it's Tito, host of the Premier Fantasy Podcast. Get all the news and analysis you need to dominate your fantasy league. I've been doing this as long as anybody in the business. I can help give you the edge in your leagues. It's the Premier Fantasy Podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history? Then you found the perfect podcast. 
I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Dennis Maniloff Show, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. The Guardian's to-do list is a mile long. I scribbled out page after page after page when I was sitting quietly by the fire. Um, I wish it were by the fire. I want it to be cold in October. But the Guardian's to-do list is really long because this offseason needs to be incredibly busy for this franchise. And let me throw out some of what I came up with off the top of my head. And I'm sure other people have as well. I'm not saying that I've got an exclusive list here, but this is just what I came up with, not looking at anything, not researching anything. This is what was rattling around in my head. Number one, majority ownership, the Dolan Family Trust, now led by Paul Dolan, needs to find a minority stake owner with serious cash. I know it's easier said than done. And by the way, if I say uh, the I word along the way, please forgive me. The Guardians are serious. If they're serious about contending for a division crown, let alone trying to get to the World Series next year, they need to increase their spending on the on-field product. No doubt that club president Chris Antonetti and Mike and GM Mike Chernoff would love an infusion of cash. They never complain about having virtually no margin for error. But it's time once again, after several years of bare bonesing it with the payroll, to give Antonetti and Chernoff a crack at building a legitimate MLB contender. The best way to do that, the most optimal way, I believe, is going to be a minority owner to come in with a, a lot of cash. The reason I say that is because I don't think the Dolans are in any mood to sell, even though they constantly let it be known that they're up against it. And, you know, there's all sorts of forces against them and, you know, year over year expenditures and capital expenditures and all this stuff, to which I say, if it's such a strain and so difficult to manage or own a team then go ahead and sell and make hundreds of millions of dollars on the sale, but it doesn't look like the Dolan ownership is going to sell. So the only real alternative to get cash in here is a minor, I mean, legit cash is a minority ownership stake. So I hope that happens in the off season. Number two, find out if Terry Francona returns for 2022. Better put hope that Terry Francona returns for 2022. He's a hall of fame manager. He will be in Cooperstown. New York enshrined there someday. He's been beset by health issues the past two seasons. Both seasons cut short. 2020, Sandy Alomar Jr. finished it. 2021, DeMarlo Hale finished it. No disrespect to Alomar Jr. or DeMarlo, but the Indians are better with Terry Francona in the dugout. And hopefully Terry Francona feels good enough to give it a shot in 2022 number three we mentioned this in the previous segment especially if a minority stake ownership is found commit to paying jose ramirez at least somewhat close to what he's worth make him an offer that's not insulting don't pick up the club option to extend his contract to a sixth year because of the bargain that you've gotten so far For a while, I was a one-man band in the media calling for Ramirez to get a new deal, but lately I've heard more and more people come around to my side. I'm happy about that. And I want to make it clear, as I have in previous podcasts, Hosey hasn't put me up to this. He doesn't know me. He's never spoken to me uh, directly. I've only been in a couple of scrums with him, and he had an interpreter. Nothing of this is coming from Hosey. Nothing of this is coming from his representatives. 
It's simply me saying that the best player in the game, I, I keep saying the game, he is one of the best players in the game, the best player on the team, one of the best players in the game, deserves a better deal from his employer. That's all. It's not. It, it's coming from me, not coming from Ramirez. And I'm still like, mind blown about why people there are enough people out there who are so willing to take the side of the billionaire owner over the millionaire player and have criticized me i don't mind getting criticized on anything let alone my stance for ramirez but when the critics come out and say oh you know you got to understand the dolans need to have a structure and they need to be knowing what they're going to pay ramirez next year and uh, what why why do you guys want to and gals line up behind a billionaire owner over a millionaire player? I'll, I'll never get that. I'm not saying players are faultless. I'm not pl- saying they're perfect. But 99 times out of 100, I'm going to side with the player over the owner. Continuing with my Indian – oh, there we go. There we go. Caught it. I know Chase Smith, producer extraordinaire, wants me to – Stop mentioning the I word, and I need to. But it is funny because when I look at my notes, there's the I word everywhere. (laughs) Uh, To-do list number four, build the fan base somehow, some way. Whether it's an ad campaign or something else, commit to winning over new fans. Status quo cannot be acceptable. Just saying we're an MLB team, we don't need to beg. If they come, they come. That doesn't cut it. It won't cut it. I get that it's going to be difficult. It's going to require money. It's going to require man or woman hours, fresh ideas. You might be dealing with the backdrop of a uh, of an MLB feud between the owners and the players when the CBA runs out in December. I don't care. The Indian, the Guardians have to do a better job of expanding their fan base. Get more people interested in Guardians baseball. And don't just rely on the name change to carry the day. Don't just say, well, because we changed the name, that's going to bring in a bunch of new people. You know what? You might have to offset the losses, excuse me, the losses of some people because of this name change. But don't think that the name change is going to do the work for you. And you're going to build your whole off season around, oh, look at this. Look at the Guardians. Look what we're doing with the Guardians. Guardians, Guardians. You need to get people interested in the on-field product again. <clears throat> at least as so far as in so far as coming to the ballpark Because we know a lot of people watch on TV, a lot of people listen on the radio and, and, you know, on their handheld devices and everything else. But you can't just sit here and go, well, people are going to come. Because they haven't been coming and the attendance hasn't been good and it needs to get better somehow, some way. Number five, when recruiting new fans, try to win over people to the Guardian's name, because I think there's a lot of work to do there. There are plenty of people who are hacked off. The name was changed to begin with, let alone to the Guardian. So you've got to win over these fans. you got to say, hey, look at this. It's a new era. It's a new name. Let's, let's go. But numbers four and five, and now even number six, which is make the game day experience less expensive, for the quote unquote average fan, these are tied to groundwork, grunt work. You, there's got to be work done. It can't just be done by uh, the, the front office. You have to have marketing, communications. Everybody's got to be on some kind of a blitz to get people reinvigorated about the Cleveland professional baseball team, now known as the Guardians. When I say game day experience less expensive for the quote-unquote average fans, I mean it. I know you're supposed to raise ticket prices every year, raise merch, or raise concessions every year because of the cost of living. Well, how about you buck the trend once and say, you know what, we're lowering prices. 
entice people to come to the ballpark with reasonable prices. Build an ad campaign around decreasing prices. Even if you don't slash them, decrease them to the point where people are going to be like, wow, that's pretty cool. A major professional franchise actually decided to lower its prices. Creativity is key here. Creativity and boldness. Don't be afraid to go low or lower at least. Among the ideas, when I think back to my childhood, Marathon Oil Night. It was taking place before Chase Smith was born. But, you know, get a sponsor for three, four, five games a year and have the tickets be super cheap or two for one or whatever it is just to get people down to the ballpark for the for the experience to even if they came as a two for one or even if they came as you know buy one get one half off on a ticket that person who wouldn't otherwise go to the game goes to the game enjoys it says i want to go back do things that encourage fans to come down to the park beyond simply the uh <laughs> The age-old Cleveland professional team enticements. Dollar dogs, hot dog race, which may or may not include a uh, veggie dog if PETA has its way. Um, You know, okay, great. We get it. Dollar dogs, yes. Hot dog races, great. Fireworks, great. But how about expanding and figuring out ways, more ways to get people excited to come to the ballpark. Number seven. Let me see. What did I have here? Number seven was related to number six. Once fans are in the park, lower the prices again. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, that puts me strictly at odds with virtually every uh, professional team even if it isn't the Indians, anywhere. But I say once you get in the park, make the concessions reasonable, the merch reasonable, make it so a family of four doesn't feel like it's, uh, you know, forking over a, a chunk of their weekly salary in order to pay for one game, the stereotypical family of four, even if it's just a couple. Try to make it a fan friendly, financially friendly experience at progressive field. The next uh, item on the list for me on the to-do list, shore up the on-field roster. If you get a minority stake infusion of cash, that's going to go a long way toward helping to do that. But I think the Indians need a minimum of two legitimate major league players brought in from somewhere else as opposed to brought, you know, to Cleveland from the minors. At least two legitimate major league players. And I, I see it as I see it, it's the outfield. Because... When I look at the Indians for 2022, I see Bobby Bradley giving a shot to start at first base with Yu Chang as the hedge. I see somebody from within playing second base. Jose Ramirez at third base. Ahmed Rosario giving a shot at short. I know a lot of people will say, oh, he needs to move. I, I think the Indians are going to give him a chance to grow into the position and write off some of his issues that he had there defensively he wound up leading the league in, or leading the team in hits so his name his bat's got to be in the lineup every day i think the indians are going to try him again at short to begin next year in the two hole left field open for an import center field uh, uh mile straw right field open for an import do not sit here and think that a Harold Ramirez or an Oscar Mercado or a Daniel Johnson or a Bradley Zimmer 
is the answer on either one of the corners. They've proven to be no better than fourth outfielders. And in Harold Ramirez's case, he, he can't play the outfield. So two legitimate sticks, and the way I see it, you bring them in to the corner outfield spots. I get that the wild card there is Josh Naylor. You don't know when he's going to return. He's a young guy that, that has promise, and you want to see what he can do. Um, his season was wrecked early in Minnesota with that violent collision in right field and uh, w- with Ernie Clement. But look to import at least two sticks. And then on top of that, a catcher, you got to have a compliment to Austin Hedges. But that's not going to cost you a whole lot. The good news is that your rotation is set. Bieber, Savale, Plesak, McKenzie, and Quantrill in any order after Bieber. I'm really excited about that rotation, and that is going to be clearly the strength of the team. The bullpen has some pieces that I think have earned the right to start the season with the Indians. Excuse me, the Guardians. Maybe I've said Indians before this, and I apologize. Guardians bullpen next year should have closer Emmanuel Classe, left-hander Anthony Ghost, um, James Karinchak. You hope he rebounds. Maybe Brian Shaw, if for some reason, he comes back again next year, the Iron Man. But there are pieces. Uh, Trevor Steffen is intriguing. So you got pieces in the bullpen. You have a rotation that's set. Logan Allen as a backup or or as a uh, rotation uh, depth. Eli Morgan is rotation depth. Maybe Allen starts the season in the bullpen and is cover in case one of the starters gets injured. So the pitching really looks good. I don't think you're going to have to spend too much on pitching other than a, a reliever. But... You don't need a closer and you don't need a starter. And in my mind, you don't need a lefty setup, man, because you've got an Anthony Ghost and you could potentially have your righty setup, man, and James Karinczak if he's figured out what ails him. So there won't be much that you need to spend on the bullpen, but you've got to spend it on the everyday lineup. Specifically, that outfield needs a massive upgrade. So those are just a few of the things on my to-do. Oh, wait, one more. One more on the to-do list. Mandate that every member of the Guardians watches Tom Amansky videos in the offseason until their eyes bleed. The Guardians must come to camp in better shape mentally and psychologically in the matter of fundamentals. No question that injuries crippled the Guardians, or the Indians in 2021. I'm I'm totally aware that their rotation was was hit hard. They had injuries all over the place. That can't excuse though the overall shoddy defensive work and the overall shoddy base running and decision making by the Indians players. They have to be uh, the Guardians now have to be better. Have to be. The acquisition of Miles Straw from the Astros Certainly helped the defense in the outfield, but still way too many mistakes in the outfield. Not only fielding, but throwing issues, inaccuracies, throwing to the wrong base. Um, Infielders not knowing what to do with cutoff throws. Pitchers not knowing to do with the ball, with what to do with the ball when it's hit to them and runners are on base. On the bases, way too many gaffes. That's unacceptable, especially a team that doesn't have a monster payroll, that can't outspend its mistakes. You have to play the game the right way, and you have to play the game fundamentally sound if you're the Guardians and you expect to compete. So this organization needs to come to camp next year, every member of its organization on the player's side of it and the coach's side of it and the manager's side of it, ready to play crisp, fundamental baseball. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I'm, and by the way, there are more uh, on the to-do list. We just don't have 
any more time because I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of looking at the to-do list, and I want to see some of this to-do list taken care of, and I'll believe it when I see it. Thank you very much for listening, and I really appreciate you taking the time, and it's an honor and a privilege to do any Dennis Manilov show, especially when it is produced and directed by Chase Smith.